Welcome to this eLearn Security video training lesson on Authentication Brute Forcing. In this video, we will see how we can use several network cracking tools in order to brute force service authentication mechanisms. The tools we will use are NCRACK, Medusa, Hydra, and Paytator. And the scenario we are going to use consists of a Linux machine with three services, FTP, SSH, and Telnet. To be sure that the machine and its services are up and running, let's first initiate a TCP SYN scan. Let's open a new terminal and instruct NMAP to perform a TCP SYN scan against our target. Let's also specify the ports that we're going to use for our tests. From the output, we can notice that the ports are open. Thus, we can continue and attempt to access them. Let's first try to access the Telnet service. For now, we'll use random credentials. To do this, we open a new terminal and try to establish a Telnet connection to our target with the following command. As we can see, we get an authentication error from the Telnet server, since we typed in the wrong credentials. Now that we know the service is working fine, it's time to see how to use the tools mentioned before in order to brute force the Telnet authentication. What we need here is a good word list. There are several word lists freely available online. Some contain the most used credentials in the world, while some others are designed for specific services we would like to brute force. One of the most popular list combination for usernames and passwords is the one called SecLists. SecLists is a collection of multiple types of lists, including username and password lists. We've already downloaded it, and here we can see all the files under the SecLists folder. The folders we will deal with are usernames and passwords. Inside the usernames directory, we can see a short list which contains the 11 most popular usernames. This is the word list we're going to use for the following tests. Let's move to the passwords directory now. Here, there are many more files that we can use. In this folder, not only can we see common passwords or the most popular passwords, but we can also see leaked passwords from popular hacks. For the purpose of this video, the word list named top shortlist will be used. Keep in mind that our word list has been slightly edited in order to execute faster during the next attacks. It's time to run our first network authentication brute force tool, NCRACK. NCRACK is one of the oldest tools used for authentication cracking and brute forcing. It was created by the NMAP team, but it is not currently maintained. The NMAP team decided to convert most of its features with scripts stored under the NSC category named brute. Either way, we think we have to show some brute force examples with NCRACK, as it can still do the job. Moreover, don't forget the important role it played in the security community. To view its manual, Let's go back to our terminal and run ncrack with the minus "-h parameter". As we can see, several options are available. Let's see some of them in action. With our first command, we run ncrack in verbose mode by adding the minus "-vv option". We do this to understand better how it works while brute forcing. Now we have to specify the username and password lists to use. To do this, we add minus capital U, followed by the path where the username word list is stored, and then the minus capital P parameter followed by the path where the password list is stored. After these two parameters, we can type our target IP address and then specify the protocol to use by adding minus P. From the results, we can see the successful passwords and usernames discovered. As we will see later on, some of the credentials are false positives. Let's try to connect from our Telnet client to check the integrity of the scan results. First, let us try to connect with the admin account. As we can see, we have successfully accessed the remote machine and we have initiated a Telnet connection. Let's now try different credentials. For example, let's see if we're able to access the service with a test account. Once again, we're able to establish a connection, so these two accounts work fine. The last username and password pair we will test is info. Here again, we're able to access the service. To prove the false positive output of NCRACK, we will also attempt to log in the other credentials found. For example, 
Let us try to access Telnet by using the username test and the relative password discovered. As we can see, we are not able to access the Telnet service on the target machine. The next protocol we will target is SSH. Let's see if we can discover its credentials. Notice that the only difference with our previous command is the protocol parameter. Now, we are trying to crack an SSH authentication. Let's run the command and see what we get. From the results, we can see that ncrack discovered some credentials. To validate them, let's establish an SSH connection with a server. To achieve this, we run the SSH command, followed by the username, the at symbol, and the IP of the target machine. After a while, we'll be asked to enter a password. By using the password found earlier, we can see that we're able to access the target computer. The next target service we want to investigate is FTP. Let's try to establish a connection and see what happens. A simple username and password form has been prompted. Since we don't know the password yet, let's type a random password here. Both the username and password combination lead to a connection refused. Again, let's run ncrack to see if we can brute force the username and password. This time the protocol should be changed to FTP. After a while, we can see that ncrack has successfully found the FTP credentials. This time, the usernames are admin, test, and info. Let's see if they really work. Again, we call the FTP command to access the server. This time, we will use the credentials just discovered. Let's start with the test account. As we can see, it's working fine, so we can keep going and test the admin account. Here again, we're able to access the FTP service. The last username we want to test is info, so let's try to establish the connection and provide the credentials found. As we were expecting, the credentials are valid, and we are now able to access the FTP server. As we can see, NCRAC is very useful and offers numerous options for brute forcing. We can use it against many protocols and, as proven, it will work efficiently. We recommend you try it under a controlled environment in order to explore all of its capabilities. Let's now see how we can perform the same actions with other tools and see if we can find any differences. The tool we're going to use now is called Medusa. Unlike NCRAC, Medusa also offers parallel testing which enables brute force to take place among multiple users, hosts, and passwords at the same time. This is very helpful if we want to target multiple hosts. Moreover, this feature is helpful because it increases the testing speed on every attack. Also, Medusa supports more protocols compared to NCRAC. Let's see if we can achieve with Medusa what we've already attained with NCRAC. To understand how Medusa works, let's go back to the terminal and run Medusa with no parameters. This will print all the available options that Medusa offers. We're going to use some of them in the next steps. To start, we are going to run our brute force attack against the Telnet server, so let's create our command by typing Medusa followed by the minus H option, which specifies the host we would like to attack. Then, we append the minus capital M argument, which instructs Medusa to use the Telnet protocol, the minus capital U and minus capital P options to specify the user and password lists to use. Although it usually works fine when targeting Windows Telnet service, in this case, Medusa was unable to find the credentials of the Telnet service. This is due to the fact that Medusa is not able to understand the logon prompt and input the credentials correctly. Let's now move to our next service, SSH. As we're going to use the same username and password list, we can reuse our previous command and change the protocol to SSH. Medusa starts the login attempts against the service. We have to wait until a valid credential is used. As this requires some time, we'll forward the video to the point where the correct username and password combination is found. Back to the brute forcing process, we can see that we have successfully enumerated an SSH username and password. Again, the user test was found. Moreover, we can see something NCRAC didn't discover. Here, Medusa is able to find some working credentials for the info account. Our next candidate is FTP. 
Let's see if we can brute force the authentication credentials with Medusa 2. Again, the only difference with the previous command is the value of protocol parameter. The user and password list will remain the same. By triggering the brute force attack, we can see the attempts run against the FTP server. After a while, Medusa prints out the successful login notification, and we can see it discovered three available users on the FTP server. As we can see, Medusa works similarly with NCRAC, and both of them succeeded to find the valid login credentials. The only difference is that Medusa was unable to use the Telnet protocol against the Telnet server, while NCRAC was unable to enumerate all user accounts on FTP. Now, let's see what we can do with our next tool, named Hydra. Hydra is another popular login authentication brute forcer that supports a big list of protocols, but also task parallelization. We can use Hydra in both GUI and command line interface, but for the purpose of this video, we will only see the latter. Before actually running any attack, let's first check the user manual. As we can see, Hydra offers several options. Let's see how we can use them in order to brute force different login authentications. Here we tell Hydra to load the username list by using the minus capital L parameter and the password list by adding the minus capital P argument. The service we would like to attack must be appended before the IP specification followed by a colon with two slashes. So here we will use SSH colon double slash and then the target IP. After executing the attack, we can see that Hydra finds the correct username and password very quickly. It found the credentials faster than any other tool we've used until now. Moreover, similarly to Medusa, we've successfully enumerated all the SSH accounts. Let's also use another very useful option. Here, we will add the minus capital T option, which instructs Hydra how many parallel connections to make against the host. The default value is 16, and we increase it to 55. As you can see, Hydra found only one out of the two passwords. We did this to point out that a faster scan may seem better, but at the same time, it may not work as efficiently. Now, let's attempt to brute force the Telnet authentication. The first change we will make to the previous command is the protocol to use. Keep in mind that Telnet will misbehave if we increase the connections to the host too much. Thus, we will change the task value to 5. The command has been initiated successfully. As you can see, Hydra successfully finds the correct credentials for the Telnet service. Finally, we have to execute Hydra against FTP. To do this, we call our previous command and replace once again the, the protocol name with FTP. A few seconds later, we can see the correct credentials highlighted in green. Our previous test has proven the authenticity of these results, so we will not verify them. From the results, we can understand that Hydra is a powerful tool. Its speed, along with its high performances and options, make it a great brute forcing tool. The last tool we will use to brute force the authentication logins is Paytater. Although it's not very easy to use at the beginning, it is a very powerful and highly customizable tool. Paytater does not offer a manual page like most of the tools. The command's explanation is hidden into its source code as comments. So our first step is to open the file to view its source and therefore read the available commands. The first interesting observation takes place here, where we can see a list of all the available modules we can use to attack the target machines. Not only is there a big list of supported protocols, but as we can see, it also offers modules related to zip password, brute forcing, and a few more. A few pages later, we can find the tool's usage. The arguments of this command are placeholders. Those indicate the type of word list and where to replace themselves with the actual words to test. Let's use the following example to understand better how this works. Here, the host IP address is referenced with the zero argument and its type is file. This means that we will have to specify the placeholder zero with a file name containing the list of IP addresses. The same is true for the other parameters. The user list location has the placeholder one while the password has two. Let's scroll down a little more to see another useful option, the minus X argument. With this option, we can perform specific actions upon receiving specific results. We can use this feature to filter the output we receive and act accordingly. For example, we can tell Paytater to ignore messages like login failed and only return results whenever a different message is received. In case we don't apply it, the output will also contain every failed login attempt. 
Another example is when a service returns various false positives or false negatives. If we are able to determine whether the messages returned are not valid, we can use the X option to prevent seeing it on the output. This is a common technique against web application forms. As the web application usually responds with an error when a wrong username or password combination is provided, we can filter these responses and avoid displaying them. Thus, we will only get a notification when a successful username and password combination is used. Let us start using Paytator and focus our test on the FTP login module. We can view the full help manual by executing Paytator followed by FTP underscore login in the minus minus help argument. A very informative output is returned. From here, we can see all the available options that we can use. For a shorter list, we can run Paytator with the FTP module loaded and no other parameters given. This will intentionally cause an error that will give back a shorter version of the module's options. Let's see how to configure these arguments. We first call Paytator, and then we import the module we would like to use. Let's also specify the host by appending the host string along with the target IP address. Afterwards, we add the user variable. Here we will add the file0 placeholder previously seen. Now, let's append the file1 variable which will represent our password word list and then set the placeholder values. Here, with the 0 argument, we instruct Paytator to read the usernames from the files stored at the following path. While with argument1, we instruct it where to look for the password list. Finally, let's set the minus x parameter to ignore the messages login incorrect. Let's now execute the command to see what happens. After a while, we can see that Paytator has successfully found the username and password. The task parallelization is what allows us to find the credential so fast. Moreover, we can see that more information is displayed during the attack. We can view the response code from the FTP, which is 230, the length, and the time the valid credentials were found. Moreover, we are able to retrieve the successful login information. As we can see, we have brute forced the FTP login in less than 30 seconds. Let's now see how we can do the same with SSH. As we don't know yet how the SSH server reacts to invalid credentials, let's attempt to log in with the wrong username and password. Then, we will take the message returned by the server and we will use it as a filter for Paytator. To do this, let's use Paytator with the SSH login module. Let's also specify the host IP and provide some random credentials for both username and password. For this example, we will use random as username and password as password. From the output, we can see that the error message is authentication failed. Now that we know how the service responds, we can use this message as a filter for a brute force attack. Let's call Paytator once again, but this time, let's set our user and password list. Before running the command, we have to append the minus x parameter followed by the filter we would like to use. In our case, we will ignore all the messages that contain authentication failed. As we can see, in a couple of seconds, Paytator is able to find the correct login and password combination. The message that escorts the response reveals the server's banner. It's time to see if it can work correctly against the Telnet protocol too. Before running any attack against the service, let's see the Telnet module options with the following command. This time, instead of the user and password parameters, we will use the option inputs. We choose to use this because the module used by Paytator for the Telnet authentication first gives the username as an input and then the password in a new line. Imagine this process like the real one. We contact the service, which asks us to provide a username. Once we input the username, we press enter. Then we insert the password and press enter again. The new line here plays the role of the enter button. Most programming languages, including Python, 
understand the request for a new line with the backslash n character set. Thus, we will use the inputs argument here in order to first give the word list with the usernames and then, after specifying a new line, we will append the password selected from the word list. Let's see how we can accomplish this in action. Here we will call the previous command, but this time let's add the inputs argument. As value of this parameter, we will use the two placeholders, file0 and file1, separated by the new line string. After we configure the input option, let's reference the host address and the username and password word list to use. We can now execute our command. Here, we have to recall how Paytator works. Depending on the message returned by the server, we can specify which username and password combination is correct. Here, we can see several weird outputs. The one that returns the date seems to be the one we are looking for. This is because services like Telnet, SSH, FTP, and more tend to return the date on the server upon a successful login. Let's use it as a filter. We call the previous command and instruct Paytator to ignore every message different from this. As we can see, after a couple of seconds, we are able to retrieve all the valid Telnet login credentials. As we've seen, Paytator is a very powerful tool for authentication cracking and brute forcing. We can use it for various protocols and its high flexibility allows us to configure it according to our needs. Thanks very much for joining us.